Sitting in the local tavern, relaxing after a hard day at work, you hear the sound of rolling thunder as you grab your flag and a veil. Taking a drink, you feel another roll of thunder that sounds even closer. You look to the other patron and you ask, was it supposed to? And then a massive boulder crashes through the wall right in front of you, throwing you to the ground, covering you in debris. As your ears continue to ring and you push whatever is left off of your chest, you look to your side and you see your weapon or maybe it's your spell book lying next to you. Grabbing your belongings, you stand up and you see outside the tavern where once there was a wall, a leg of monumental proportion stomp the ground. It shakes you to your core. Determined, you run out into the street through the newly made entrance and you see a towering giant grab a horse and throw it with ease at the guard tower, destroying both the tower and the animal in one single action. You are in for a fight for whatever is left of your village. Who is to know what is to come? Welcome to the Storm King's Thunder. Hello everyone, my name is Bo, and this is Critical Masterpiece. Today, we're going to talk about one of my absolute favorite modules and how you as a dungeon master can run this campaign in such a way that it will hook your players from the very beginning, while at the exact same time, giving you a solid foundation to lead the players into an epic tale of giants and dragons. First, let's discuss some administrative parts of this campaign. This video is here to assist you as a dungeon master in explaining the introduction, helping you guide you through chapter one. So yes, if you are a player, there will be some general spoilers throughout the rest of this video. With that, starting off, this book sets your adventures in the same area as Tyranny of Dragons and Prince of the Apocalypse. There's nothing wrong with this. In fact, Begin the beginning of this story revolves around the repercussions of those modules, the Tearing of Dragons. A simple caveat, if you have never read through that adventure, your players or your players have never heard of this, it is in my opinion best not to go into this with your players. They may ask questions or get bogged down with unnecessary details that need not explaining. This story will progress your adventures from level 1 to level 11. It can take a couple of months to well over a year to complete. Yet, this is all dependent upon the pace of which you decide. There is a lot to explore in this world, and if you as a dungeon master are willing to deviate from the main quest from time to time, you will have a rich and vibrant world to explain with cities, factions, and politics to entertain even the most seasoned of players. You can explain that there is a lot going on here in this part of the world, but be careful not to go too far into what is happening. Players may be intrigued in horse stables rather than the threat of imminent danger from the local landscape. If you have overly curious players, you should not dive too deep for there are too many loose ends or loose threads that the players could tug on making them lose sight of the main purpose of this adventure fighting giants and dragons before i go any further in how to run this uh, this chapter of this module i will go through a few pieces of information that you may want to familiarize yourself with prior to running this campaign Though I haven't truly explained in my earlier videos, you will need to read a bit ahead in this book so you are ready for what is to come. For one, you need to know the possible directions the book will lead you after the party completes the three main story beats set in chapter one. Second, I have found it useful to put together a list of shops stores and places that your party may stumble across while in the city because the book will not help you with this. I do have to give credit to this book because it is very good at giving you the tools to role play like the tavern owner or the head of the city. But let's say the players want to walk uh, the streets of this said town. They will almost always ask, what is that 
uh, that I'm looking at uh, over there. Unless you are a master of improv and you have an eidetic memory, you will have a hard time thinking of names of shops and areas as well as remembering the names of the people who work there. My way of solving this is to create a document with shops in alphabetical order, and under each of these uh, names, you'll have a list of the owner and a, a few employees that would work there. Example of these places that you'll see in my own towns are, are as follows. Though it's not in alphabetical order here. Uh, an alchemist, a blacksmith, a candle shop, a church, a temple uh, to a god or gods, a, a general store, some kind of place that handles the dead, if that isn't the church, which I have already mentioned, a tannery, and so on. With a bit of the administrative things now covered, let us get into an overview of the Storm King's Thunder. First thing that you will need to familiarize yourself with is the ordering. The ordering is the hierarchy of the most worthy to the least in relation to the giants and how they see themselves, how the gods of all the giants see the worthiness of them. This method of the ordering can be a very violent and brutal display of worth in relation to their giant type. So a fire giant will display their worth at much differently than what a hill giant's display of worthiness is. If you want to explain the ordering, there are many ways to do this. You can read up on the ordering in books from the DMs Guild, Read wiki or fan sites, but it is in my opinion that showing this hierarchy as it relates to the ordering uh, is with action and role play. I have seen this to be the best way to educate your players with these ideas rather than you giving 10 minutes of expo exposition to your players in the middle of the game. Yet. For the purposes of this video, I will run down a simplistic way what summarizes all of what I have learned. This is in no way a perfect account of what the ordering is, but you will definitely get the idea. Your way of explaining this abstract concept does not need to be perfect, but your players will accept the way that you present the ordering because you are the dungeon master. This is your world. This is how the ordering works. Remember, this is merely one way of describing the six types of giants, how they can show their worth to their god. This book, as well as the Monster Manual, page 149, describes ordering in, quote, general terms, unquote. With that, showing your players in-game is a much more powerful way, and in doing so, this is one campaign they won't soon forget. As I said before, showing how the giants live and how they treat all the others is a good way to explain in action rather than in words. Here's the description of the six types of giants and how they can be portrayed in game. Let's get started. Starting off with the cloud giants, they live very extravagant lives. Lots of shiny and over-the-top clothes, including jewelry. They live very remote places and are near impossible to access. These giants see all others, even their own, as tools to be exploited for the gain of wealth and knowledge. Play them as quiet individuals, but easily annoyed if they are in the presence of other giants, they will not hesitate to boast about how wealthy or honorable they are. And in doing so, they will brag and showing off their extravagant possessions and trying to show all the others that they are at the top of their respective kinfolk. Second, there are the fire giants. These giants are master craftsmen and are by far the best at what they do. No other creature can forge a blade in quite the manner that a fire giant can. These giants have a lot of servants, both willing and unwilling, and they see worth in the test of honor through combat and feats of strength. They see the weak as a poison upon the land, and it is the giant's duty to extinguish these weak forms of life from the land. 
Third are the Frost Giants. These are the true warriors of the giant kin. They are the hunters and skilled survival survivalists of the order. These giants are usually the ones that pillage in mass and hunt in packs. This is where they thrive, and that is how I would play them. If you meet a frost giant that wishes to talk, put three or four more hiding out in the wilderness, just waiting to strike. Some might think that these creatures are solitary individuals, yet I see them as pack hunters, deadly on the prowl. These giants respect surviving the harshness of the wilderness, and they may confront the party only after a nasty ordeal, possibly praising them for surviving, though they will still call them small and weak in the same exact sentence. You, as the DM, could set loose a pack of summoned wolves on the party prior to actually engaging them in some sort of discourse. This again is to see if they are worthy of their time. Fourth, these are hill giants. These lumbering creatures can be perceived as deceptively weak, but you may want to have a lot of them charging in from all directions, trying to claim the party as their snack. During the initial stages of the encounter, they would all work together to fight, but yet bicker at each other to see who would feast on them first. They will eat anything that is within reach, and Play them accordingly. These giants pride themselves on who is the biggest or who has the, had the largest meal. Not only do they eat constantly, they have pouches filled with all different kinds of livestock at the ready. They will chew upon these animals when they are bored or when they want to show off. If they are in a group or with other giants, these are the ones that will yell out and demand ridiculous items and even more food. Whatever they ask for as their payment, they might just correct themselves and double it. This is to show that they are the ones that can devour more than the others and more than they did the last time. Fifth are stone giants. These are the peaceful yet reclusive giants that are masters of stonework. Quiet, they hold vast amounts of knowledge long forgotten by everyone else. I play them similar to a druid and more knowledgeable than even the oldest of all the elves. These giants are very reluctant to help, but if persuaded, they can be a treasure trove of information, and more importantly, a guide to what is next. Last, but not least, are the storm giants. These giants are those that live truly secluded lives. All of the giants, of all the giants, these are the most difficult to find and even find or gain an audience. Those who are fortunate to find an audience with a storm giant must be very careful not to ask for too much. If it becomes apparent to these giants, he or she will become angered, and the only way to feel satisfied with releasing all of this bent up anger is by releasing it in total destruction of the room that the giant is standing in. Death of a short lived mortal is minuscule to that of a storm giant. They live incredibly long lives and have witnessed countless kingdoms rise and fall. You as a dungeon master are going to introduce a storm giant to the players. Have them first meet an NPC that has met a storm giant that has acted out in anger. Have this NPC warn them of the utter destruction that these giants are capable of. Now that you know the general actions of each of the giants, here are the 10 major players in the campaign that need a brief introduction. First is King Hecaton. He is not a player in the immediate campaign, but during the end, he is a major help to the players when they encounter a no-win scenario. He is the king and ruler of all the giants. He used to possess uh, the item that 
all the other giants are wishing to own. Don't know how to exactly pronounce it, but it's the Kolinor Scepter of the Ordering, which harnesses the power of the Wyrwom's Skull Throne. Next is Miram, the oldest of the three sisters. She is the most volatile, and she is quick to act out due to her inability to control her emotions. A one-dimensional character, she is fairly easy to play, and since she is the eldest of the three, she believes that she is the one to rule in place of her missing father. The second of the three sisters is Nim, bold and calculating. She is slow to anger, but equally as deadly when she is angry. Frustrated that the youngest of the three sisters was chosen to rule in place of their missing father, she has decided to side with Miram. Nim accepts that Miram should be the one to rule in the place of the missing father. Now to the youngest of the three sisters. This is Sorissa, a level-headed giant that fears the destructive nature of all her folk. Now in power, she reluctantly accepts the responsibility because she is desperate to find answers. She wants to find out what is happening and being gifted the Kolinor Scepter by her father, she is desperate to find the truth. Maintaining possession of the Scepter is the only way she is able to keep all of the other giants in line during this tumultuous time. Now moving on. Here are the others that make up the power dynamic of this story, starting first with Limrith. She is an ancient blue dragon who assumes the form of a storm giant. With only bad intentions, she weasels her way into being an aide to Sarissa, giving her counsel, and at the exact same time, she is secretly seeding jealousy with the other two sisters. In this disguise, she was able to put the two elder sisters in touch with a kraken who resides in this region. This deadly entity, the kraken, has a massive following that aids the two sisters in their plot to try to reclaim the throne. Next on our list of influential members of this court are the giant lords. Because all believe that the king is dead, these five giant lords set out into the world in hopes to reshape the ordering through their deeds. The first is Chief Guh, a gluttonous female hill giant that has ordered all of her husbands to gather all the food that they can carry and bring it to her so she can consume it in front of all of them and grow in size, showing to the gods that she is worthy of being the best. Second is Thang Kailathika, a female stone giant that withdrew to her home in a grouping of caves where she perceived through a meditative state that the small folk corrupted the dreams of the giants by building settlements all throughout the land. She is out to destroy all that they have built and record it for the gods to admire. Next is Jarl Storvold, a frost giant, who is in search of a powerful relic that can freeze the waters and make the wearer immortal. Not realizing that he was tricked by the wizard, he now foolishly tracks the wrong family member who is related to the owner of the relic. This distant family member has no idea that anyone has the artifact, let alone someone in his bloodline. On to Duke Zalto, a fire giant who believes that he can reshape the ordering by slaying the giant's ancient enemies, the dragons. He is in search for pieces of the titan of death called the Vanandad. Once all the pieces are collected and reforged, he wants to unleash it upon the world. Next is Countess Saranursai the vainglorious cloud giant noble, in search for knowledge and relics of the past. She is currently in search for the long-lost trove of dragon magic, 
She wishes to knock the storm giants from the top of the ordering. And once this is done, she will use her newfound powers to destroy all of her other rivals as well as Hecaton's court. Now that we have some of the major players described, we can move on to chapter one. With other modules and, or settings, those books set you into the mix fairly quickly. This campaign, however, doesn't do this. Authors give you four simple ideas that have little to no bearing on the story, or to have you get the players motivated to visit a small village in the outlying countryside. These hooks are flimsy at best. As I mentioned in the beginning, it is important to have a solid foundation for your players to start from. But you do not have to use the example that I gave you in my introduction. You may want to have a reason why the players are on the road in the first place. Now, recovering from a tragedy is an easy way to give your players all that they need to be traveling on the road. I have ran a lot of Dungeons & Dragons games, and if there is one thing that I have noticed, it is that the players typically ask, how or why are we even doing this in the first place? Again, this leads me back to my introduction. Prior to the start of the game, give a name or a contact to each of your players. These contacts are now prisoners captured by goblins in the Dripping Caves. The prisoners that they know in the village of Nightstone may have more answers to the questions that they are looking for. Role playing this out would be fairly easy. As the adventurers gather their things after the attack, the adventurers ask the others in the town before they leave again. Notes of additional shops and people will help you through this uh, crucial starting point. These other villagers can say, I think that so-and-so at Nightstone may have more answers. This gives the players a reason to be on the road when the adventure inside this book picks up. Whether you start the story off on the road or you have an event that leads them to getting on the road to Nightstone, the players will be more invested if they have a genuine purpose for going there. Once the players arrive at Nightstone, the module gives a pretty good reason to investigate the Palisade rather than following a bunch of tracks to the north. Chapter 1, Part 1 The Village of Nightstone Before I start to walk through the first part of this module, understand that if I were to explain every nuance of each subpart of Chapter 1, this video would be well over an hour. So I'm going to have to go over each area briefly but add in why each situation I am describing is important to the next stage of the chapter. Secondly, if I were to go over each location in chapter 1 without giving a bit more detail into why it is there, then I would be doing a disservice to you. As this channel is here to assist the DM in running a pre-made module, there will be things added and altered in my descriptions to help spur your imagination, but the locations and the events will still be true to the story for the most part. With that being said, let's get into the story, the village of Nightstone. It is a palisade surrounded by a moat with only one real entrance, a lower drawbridge on the west side of the perimeter. The adventurers hear a church bell off in the distance, and it will continue to ring until the players find a way to make it stop. If the players do not stop or do not investigate the noise, I would urge you as the dungeon master to find a creative way to entice your players to investigate the reason why the bell hasn't stopped ringing. A good way to remind the players is that this sound could attract unwelcome guests into an already uncertain and dangerous situation. I mean, they were already attacked by giants, and they are in no condition to fight at the moment. This doesn't have to be said in those exact words, but 
you can have creatures like wolves or bears wandering closer to the location with more noises in the trees from which the players came from. Nightstone is mostly abandoned, but there are areas such as the inn and keep that serve as major plot points. These can and should be used to progress the story. And just like other games, a long rest is not possible due to the threat of goblin intrusion during the night. This is if you allow the players to search all day in the village. But getting back to the church bell, the church bell ringing should be more than enough to entice the players to investigate. This leads them to their first encounter. Two goblins. Not much of a fight, but the module doesn't give a good reason to why the goblins are in Nightstone in the first place. You as a dungeon master may want to think of a reason for the goblins being there. A simple reason for the goblins arriving is because they were sent by their boss, Park, which I'll be getting into a little bit later. A good way to play this off is that all the goblins say, We are looking for the gold! If the players negotiate, possibly keeping one or more alive, there are many ways you can have this benefit the party later. We will uh, get to that shortly. As the players move through the village, they will encounter more goblins in each of the smaller buildings. A specter in the graveyard, a, a spy in the inn, and guards grieving over Lady Nadar at the keep. Each one of these events can easily tie into the narrative of the story that leads the players on a quest uh, for clues to where the villagers could possibly be. Yes, I know that this is the premise of the chapter, uh, but making it feel organic can be difficult if you have never run this campaign before. Once the party finishes the church, they can start investigating the rest of Nightstone. Whether they investigate the inn or head to the castle, you as a dungeon master may want to guide the players to certain locations by giving heavier descriptions of the landscape, uh, thereby explaining in greater detail aspects of their surroundings so that they may pick up the next clue that they should possibly investigate. A simple way to get their attention is to explain that as you get closer to the keep, a small amount of grayish-white smoke begins to pour out of one of the newly exposed holes in the roof. If they don't get the hint there, have everyone in the party roll some sort of wisdom check at advantage. Why, you might ask? Naturally, be on a, being on edge because of the goblins in the area, they would be discussing how to not alert enemies to their location. And now that there is a cylinder of smoke coming from the keep, alerting the party to activity in the most fortified location of Nightstone. Now that the players are at the keep, they investigate the structure. There they find four guards grieving over Lady Nadar. At this point, the module puts the players in a unique power dynamic. The book states that there is no leader among the four guards, but I would switch it up. This is not the time to have the players walk all over your NPCs. This sets the precedent that all the NPCs in this module are able to just be pushed around, and if that is the case, then you will get resistance every time they want to intimidate or coerce an NPC. Remember. It is always up to you as a DM, but continuing on with this train of thought, choose a guard that you would feel is the one that is the leader of the four and have him or her speak for the group. As the discussion progresses, the leader of the guards does not want the lady's body to be rummaged through, not to disrespect the dead. I would advise not to make the party, the players roll to see if they can slide of hand or persuade the uh, guards to turn over the ring that they should find. Rather, ask the players to describe how 
or what they would do to entice the guards to hand over the ring. This will get the players to work as a group to think of a way to come up with a solution. Hopefully, it will not turn into a murder hobo situation. And in that case, I would increase one of those uh, guards, preferably the one that you chose, to be a CR2 NPC. Have them realize they may be outmatched. Yet you do not have to alter any of the stats of the NPCs if you so desire. Saying it again, this is your campaign and you can let your players do whatever they want. Once they have the ring, they can then proceed on to the next objective. Having the ring will come into play during the Dripping Caves and the Floating Spire. The Nightstone Inn is the next lead up to the search for the missing villagers who are hiding out in the Dripping Caves. The players will encounter more goblins here and hopefully scour every room. When they do, they will meet an NPC by the name of Kella Darkhope. She will be the reason why the major encounter in the village occurs. After all is said and done with killing all of the goblins and re retrieving the ring and the keep, you then can proceed on to the conclusion of, of Nightstone, the encounter with the Seven Snakes. It is important to note that Kella is a spy. She is waiting for her band of cohorts to arrive. She will be a good asset to use to unload a lot of information when it comes to where the rest of the villagers are. She can play the victim at first, stating that the uh, owner of the inn ran off and uh, with the others to the caves to the north, leaving her behind. Yet, being that she is a spy, she is here to use Nightstone as a base of operations, and now the residents are gone, this place is ripe for the picking. Yes, this module says that she was there to uh, infiltrate the village as a monk, that this can easily be altered and she could be there to set up shop prior to the party even arriving. She was held up by the swarm of goblins, making it near impossible to escape and this can lead the players into a false sense of security. Once the encounter of Nightstone Inn is over, and Kella is part of the group, the encounter of the Seven Snakes can occur. As the module states, you can use Kella as an NPC to join the adventures and assist the party if they get in over their head. But I would advise playing her as one that refuses to fight unless in mortal danger. Once you have a feel that the players are finished investigating the village, the last major encounter can begin, the Seven Snakes. Whether you spring the orc encounter right when the tension is high, or possibly when a fight is about to go down, this is when I would spring the orcs. To help progress the story a bit, try and have the leader, Zulkin, as well as Kella survive Though, having them die in front of the party might also scare the players just enough to try and have them escape, which is the whole idea. This, is, this will make fighting the orcs feel a, a bit more terrifying. I mean, having your players rely on what was once an enemy to help them now escape to the north. They may feel like escaping with their lives is a good compromise to dine at the hands of around 60 or so orcs. Since it will take time for the orcs uh, to get to the walls, have Kella and her group uh, convince the players that the seven snakes can be a distraction as the players sneak off without being detected. Explain through dialogue that they have seen these orcs in battle and they barely survived. Those that they captured receive no mercy. In payment for the player's goodwill, Zulkin can still give the treasure that the players would have looted if they dispatched him before the orcs uh, attacked. If the players think that this is too easy, have them roll some sort of insight or intelligence check as a group. 
and when someone rolls even moderately well, you can say that Zulkin may see these players as possible allies that he could use later, um, and with that being the case, this fools Zulkin into a false sense of security, similar to how the players were. Now on to chapter 1, part 2. Once the players make their escape north, it will not take more than a few moments of searching to find the tracks of the villagers. The players can search even longer and find more than one entrance to the caves. Due to there being 31 citizens all running for their lives, they were not thinking of covering their tracks. I mean, they're just citizens for goodness sakes. And now finding a few different entrances to the cave, they will have now multiple ways to begin the next encounter. I love this part of the adventure because it gives the players options to approach a problem rather than a single path that only feels like, feels like a linear adventure. So that's exactly what this is. The players make it through the cave, fighting a black pudding, which may kill one or two of the adventurers, and then encounter the goblin boss, Hark. I say this because whether they dispose of the black pudding before they meet Hark, or if this is uh, a condition for the release of the prisoners, they have to take care of every issue that the cave has to offer. We have now reached the point to why you gave the players a contact that we uh, stated at the beginning of this video. Since their contact was not in Nightstone, they find their contact here in the caves as prisoners to the goblins. Each player may have a different contact to speak with, and this will help lead the players to make tough decisions of what story thread they will choose after they survive the caves. In the next chapter, there are three different quests or locations that the DM can choose or now have the players choose for you. The module sets up the story with an easy plot hook that is given by one individual Morak Urgray, by giving three different people in the cave quest hooks, it will feel more organic. I know that this is a bit more work on you as a DM, but it will pay off. Give three different NBCs, even if one of them is still Urgray, the information about the next location. The three quests are to deliver news uh, to someone in either Brimshander, the Golden Fields, or Tribor. This is the first time that the ring from Lady Nadar will come into play. If they uh, head to Brimshander, the ring from Lady Nadar can be of great importance. Have the contact state that the sheriff in Brimshander may want proof from the party that they mean business and the ring will help them in this quest. Now that they have the ring, I suggest playing the sheriff a bit angry or unsettled when he hears of the news which a total stranger is giving him. Yet, if they show the proof that they are from Nightstone by presenting the ring, he could change his tune and give more information on the next lead to the quest. I know that this is probably more obvious, but having a few choices gives the player a feel that they are in control of where to go, and in doing so, they will feel more invested in the story. Now they have a difficult decision on their hands. The players will be torn as to which quest to pick from. It is up to the players to give a compelling reason to the rest of the party as to why they should visit the locations the NPCs are asking the players to visit. Now that the players have their quests, it is time to finish the Dripping Caves, and this is in regards to the encounter with the Goblin Boss. The players have two options to get rid of the Goblin Boss. Kill him or negotiate with him. Hopefully it is the latter of the two. If the players let some of the goblins live while they were investigating Nightstone, the players will be able to recognize those goblins. 
when the goblins recognize the players, have them walk over to Hark and speak loud enough for everyone to hear. Let the players clearly hear the goblins say, These are the creatures that were kind and smart, and they were wise enough to let us go. This can lead it to easier negotiations with the goblin boss. This will in turn make it easier to lower the amount of ransom that the players will need to pay for for each of the prisoners and have Ark demand at first the full amount. But then after the goblins talk to him, Ark ponders the situation and changes his mind, turn, lowers the ransom by half for each individual. He will at first demand something like one gold piece for each prisoner. But with the change in heart, he can lower the ransom to logically five silver pieces per person, even giving some of the treasure of his stash. He can explain to the party that he is in a good mood because of the kindness that the players exhibited towards his kin. He could then offer his friendship to the party, making a pleasant benefit to the players' actions and gaining an unexpected but valuable ally. Chapter 1, Part 3 As the players depart the cave, whether they go back, to the, or go back with the citizens or part ways from there, the adventurers will then have the last encounter of Chapter 1, the Tower of Zephyros. With the way that we have now shifted these minor elements of the story, the players now received the next clue to their plot point by one of the contacts in the caves rather than going back to the village. They now have no reason to return to the village of Nightstone. Once again, this leads the adventures towards uh, the next part organically and it has a natural flow of events. I don't think it needs to be said, but do not immediately put the flying tower within sight of the village or the survivors of the cave. The citizens of Nightstone are already on edge with being bombarded by giants, almost eaten by rats and goblins, and having to bury their dead in the village they do not need a massive tower hovering above them once again for fears that they are going to be slaughtered after the ordeal that they just went through. That being said, the adventurers meet a friendly cloud giant by the name of Zephyros. Through a, a little clunky in the module's descriptions, the stairs appear and allow the players to ascend the steps and arrive at the main door of the tower. There, they enter into the tower without issue, and they begin to learn a little bit more about what is going on. The book gives a good reason as to why the giant doesn't get directly involved. And since it is the will of the other planetar planetar enti entities, he is unwilling no matter how persuasive the players are at asking. Now moving on. There are a few really neat things about the tower. One being that there are griffins roosting on the highest level of the tower. This can be a, a natural deterrent for the players if they get too close to this area of wild animals. A wild animal against a fourth level player could be the death of that individual. I would describe this Part by saying that there are dozens of griffins at the top and they're all making an ungodly amount of noise if any medium or smaller creature approaches. While the players are just getting the lay of the tower and possibly the first long rest of chapter one, have the encounter the howling hatred. The cultists want to speak with Zephyros. As it is said in the book, if the players get in their way or try to stop the interaction from happening, the cultists will attack. Two ways to go about this encounter before the fight erupts describe the cultists in such a way that 
they look fairly plain. Uh, it, not in cultist robes, but in dark leather armor. This may lead the players into thinking that these are more Zatherum, such as Nightstone. This may prompt the players to ask pointed questions, either to, uh, to the DM or to the NPCs. If and when they do, have one of the cultists get extremely agitated and attack the players. An all-out brawl is kind of what this module was expecting. And this can go one of two ways. The players can wipe the floor with the cultists, and Zephyros will be impressed with the adventurers, or the adventurers will have a bit a difficult time with the fight. And the giant can step in to assist, showing the players that these skies are filled with all sorts of dangerous individuals. Either way, the players will get some loot from all of these cultists. I mean, who doesn't like some loot? The players are traveling to Brimshander or Tribor. The encounter of the orb strike can occur. This is fairly straightforward. The players see an adult silver dragon with three armed dwarves in each of the talons. They are uh, the, these dwarves are there to destroy the navigation orb. This encounter was meant to be done as roleplay. I mean, come on, if uh, an adult silver dragon wasn't a big enough clue, then what is? This is uh, where the Ring of Lady Nadar can come into play once again. The dwarves are part of the Lord's Alliance, and more importantly, they are attacking the Flying Tower at the request of Queen Dagnabet. As the DM, I would definitely agree that the queen of the area would know of Lady Nadar. And if the players are acting in good faith towards the dwarves, these dwarves can use sending or some other kind of spell to ask the queen if she knows of this individual. When the encounter is peacefully resolved, they can finish out the rest of the journey to the desired location and begin Chapter 2. The players will be 5th level and this is where the story starts getting good. Just like any other campaign or module, this is going to take a lot of work, a bit of planning, and some quick thinking to get the players to go in the direction you want to lead them. I know that what I have described will take some getting used to, but taking notes, highlighting a few people in the book, and understanding how the module wants to lead the players you can easily tweak and adjust your version of this campaign to fit whatever it is. Most importantly, if you show your players that you are truly invested in the story, they will show their appreciation by getting excited to see what is to come. I hope this video spurs your imagination and gets you to become a better dungeon master or leads you to improving the game that you are currently running. In any case, until next time, have fun adventuring.